Hello, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Silvana Falcon, and I am an Associate Professor of Latin American and Latino Studies and the Director of the Research Center for the Americas at UC Santa Cruz, which is one of the co-sponsors of this event. Before we get fully underway, I want to acknowledge that the land where UC Santa Cruz sits is the unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking Yupi tribe. Today, the Ama Mutsun tribal band, which is comprised of the descendants of indigenous peoples taken to missions Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the central coast is working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. The UCSC University Forum, excuse me, land acknowledgement is important for recognizing the history of stolen lands and the presence of indigenous peoples and their enduring relationship to their traditional homelands. And we believe it is important that land acknowledgements aren't just a token gesture. The UCSC University Forum is an ongoing series focusing on the relevance of our research to the community and to social, economic, environmental, and political issues, proudly featuring the impact of research conducted at UC Santa Cruz. I would like to share a couple of details about this afternoon's event. We are using a webinar tool, so there's no chat function. We will have an opportunity to answer your questions at the end of the presentations. And we invite you to submit your questions in the Q&A box below at any time. You can access the closed captioning feature available on Zoom by clicking the CC box on your screen and selecting show subtitles. A reminder that this event is being recorded. This university forum event celebrates the release of precarity and belonging, labor, migration, and non-citizenship, co-edited by UC Santa Cruz professors, Catherine S. Ramirez, myself, Silvana Falcon, Juan Poblete, Stephen C. McKay, and Felicity Amaya Schaefer. Rutgers University Press published this book earlier this year. Our moderator this afternoon is Dr. Camila Hawthorne, Assistant Professor of Sociology at UC Santa Cruz. On behalf of myself and the co-editors of Precarity and Belonging, we would like to thank the UC Santa Cruz staff who work tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure this event's success as part of the University Forum. Thank you, Nicole Silva. Thank you, Diana Hogue. And thank you, Kristen Palma of University Relations. Thank you also to Dario Leon of the RCA. Thank you to our event co-sponsors, the Humanities Institute, the Institute for Social Transformation, Oaks College, the Baskin Endowed Chair of Feminist Studies, and the Research Center for the Americas. The RCA has adopted the theme of mobilities and belonging for the next two academic years. Our hope is to promote meaningful conversations at UC Santa Cruz and beyond that explore this theme alongside the crises that displace, move and divide us in order to create new opportunities to rethink and reimagine our collective trajectories and futures. <laughs> 
and to spark discussions about what brings us and holds us together. We invite you to learn more about our theme and our upcoming events by clicking on the link in the chat. As we continue to navigate challenging times in our world, we hope you find the conversation today both provocative and inspiring as we seek to rebuild what has been broken and to create or imagine new ways of coexisting. Now it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Catherine S. Ramirez, one of the co-editors of Precarity and Belonging. Dr. Ramirez is a professor and chair of the Latin American and Latino Studies Department at UC Santa Cruz. She is the author of Assimilation, an Alternative History, and The Woman in the Zoot Suit, Gender, Nationalism, and the Cultural Politics of Memory. She is a scholar of Mexican American history, race, migration, and citizenship, and Latinx literature and visual culture. She has written for the New York Times, The Atlantic, Public Books, and Boom California. Dr. Ramirez will provide an overview of the book's history and will introduce our events moderator, Dr. Camila Hawthorne. Thank you, Silvana. I'm going to share my screen. From 2013 until 2018, I directed UCSC's Chicano Latino Research Center, now the Research Center for the Americas. Silvana Falcon, the Research Center's current director, Steve McKay, Juan Poblete, and Felicity Amaya Schaefer served on the center's steering committee. The Research Center was founded over 25 years ago as a hub for Chicanx, Latinx, and Latin American studies. Together, the members of the steering committee and I expanded its scope to include migration in and beyond the Americas. And to that end, we hosted nearly a hundred public events on the subject of migration over five years. In 2015, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation invited UCSC to apply for a John E. Sawyer seminar on the comparative study of cultures and the singular in its name notwithstanding, a Sawyer seminar is a series of events organized around a particular theme or question. Silvana, Steve, Juan, Felicity, and I decided to throw our hat in the ring and proposed a Sawyer seminar on non-citizenship. We sought to shed light on the historical development of the categories of the citizen and the non-citizen and to foster a dialogue about belonging and rights. And we were proud, thrilled, and not quite sure what we were in for when we won UCSC's inaugural Sawyer Seminar grant. Over the following academic year, and with the support of UCSC's Humanities Institute, Divisions of Social Sciences and Graduate Studies, and Office of Research, we hosted nine visiting scholars and 14 events that attracted over 600 attendees. We awarded year-long fellowships to two UCSC graduate students, Sering Wangmo in literature and Claudia Lopez in sociology. And we hired a postdoctoral fellow, a geographer by the name of Emily Mitchell Eaton. And today, Sering, Claudia, and Emily, all pictured here, our faculty at Villanova University, Cal State Long Beach, and Colgate University, respectively. My co-editors and I are proud of their achievements and delighted that they are joining us virtually this afternoon. So our volume is the culmination of the conversations engendered by UCSC's Research Center for the Americas and very much a product of our campus. Our volume brings together 22 social scientists and humanities scholars, including Sering, Claudia, Emily, Susan Coutine, who is joining us from UC Irvine, Veronique Fortan, and Alejandro Grimson, both of whom are zooming in from Canada and Argentina, respectively. Together, the contributors to our book study mobility via the lenses of migration and precarity 
um, an overwhelming and persistent condition of unpredictability, instability, and insecurity. And we'll be talking a lot more about precarity this afternoon. We look at the institutions, practices, historical legacies, and narratives that have enabled, inhibited, or distorted social inclusion and civic and political participation from Silicon Valley to Singapore and from the 19th century until the pandemic of our time. By highlighting the commonalities between non-citizens and citizens, precarity and belonging strives to mitigate the divisiveness that threatens democracies in the 21st century. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is um, introduce uh, our colleague, Camilla Hawthorn. I will stop sharing my screen. All righty. It gives my co-editors and me great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Hawthorne to this forum. She comes to us by way of Brown University, the University of Padua in Italy, and UC Berkeley, where she earned her PhD in geography in 2018. And today, Dr. Hawthorne is Assistant Professor of Sociology and Faculty in Critical Race and Ethnic Studies, at the Science and Justice Research Center and in the Legal Studies Program at UCSC. She's the author and co-editor of many publications, among them the 2021 volume, The Black Mediterranean, Bodies, Borders, and Citizenship, her forthcoming book, Contesting Race and Citizenship, Youth Politics in the Black Mediterranean, explores the ways that citizenship has emerged as a key terrain of struggle over racial nationalism in Italy. In 2020, Corriere della Sera, Italy's most widely read newspaper, declared her one of the most pioneering, creative, influential, revolutionary, resilient, and nonconformist 110 women of the year. She shares this honor with the likes of Angela Merkel, Barbara Streisand, and Queen Elizabeth II. Please join me in welcoming our very own Professor Camilla Hawthorne. Thank you so much for that introduction, Kat. And thank you all for inviting me to celebrate this brilliant, important, and timely book. If we look around the world, we can see all the ways that questions of citizenship and non-citizenship are crucial for understanding how racism, capitalism, and borders are conjoined and reworked in our current political moment. Just to name a few. In the United Kingdom, supporters of Brexit explicitly contrast the figure of the suffering white British citizen with the figure of the immigrant undeserving poor. In the United States, Far-right political figures continually express desires to abolish birthright citizenship because it supposedly creates a magnet for illegal immigration, and dreamers continue to mobilize in a tenuous state of legal liminality, held hostage by racialized neoliberal logics of deservingness and productivity. The key words that anchor this volume, precarity and non-belonging, constitute to paraphrase a formulation coined by the abolitionist geographer Ruth Wilson Gilmore, a powerful fatal coupling in our modern world. But now I would like to turn to introduce Professor Juan Poblete, who is one of the volume's editors. Juan Poblete is professor of Latino, um, Latin and Latino American literature and cultural studies at UC Santa Cruz. He's the author of three books on Latin American cultural studies, editor of New Approaches to Latin American Studies, Culture and Power in 2018, and Critical Latin American and Latino Studies in 2003, and co-editor of seven other volumes, including the volume that we'll be discussing today, Labor of Precarity and Belonging, Labor, Migration, and Non-Citizenship. Thanks, Camila. Um... My job is to tell you what our book uh, or our intro is about in about five minutes. So I'm gonna to try to do that. The book, Precarity and Belonging, Labor, Migration and Non-Citizenship explores in an interdisciplinary context, the connections between three areas, 
migration, belonging, and precarity. At the heart of each of these three areas, we have placed key concepts, physical mobility for migration, citizenship and non-citizenship for belonging, and social and economic upward and downward mobility for precarity. This triangulation allows us to understand comparatively the conditions of migrants and national workers, and as a result of that contrast, propose a potential politics of commonality. So let me explain what we mean by that. If we take belonging and thus citizenship and non-citizenship, <clears throat> we can see that migrants often don't have the status of have temporary statuses, but in daily life in our communities, they create through what we call acts of citizenship, the basis of a firmer form of belonging. National workers, on the other hand, have the legal status, but cannot always exercise it, or not always to the fullest extent. African American and Native American people in the United States, for example, after long struggles for citizenship to this day, have often devalued or second class citizenships. In both these contexts, the migrant and the non white worker um, or citizen, citizenship is far from being a static condition and instead contracts and expands historically as determined by social struggles. If we now move on to precarity, that is to say to social and economic upward and downward mobility, we can see that migrants have significant labor participation in areas such as construction, agriculture, services, and the provision of care but work themselves in precarious and often dangerous conditions, often in union allergic businesses, often with no access to health benefits or social security. Many less educated working class national white workers, on the other hand, have been informalized, de-skilled, made redundant, by the combined impact of globalization or outsourcing and automatization. And they have trouble finding durable employment. But also precarity affects not just working class workers, but also white collar workers. So we could just name two of them, um, educators to stay with the familiar and say engineers or code designers who often live on uh, a contract to contract uh, uh, form without stability or access to company generated benefits such as health uh, or uh, pension benefits. In these two areas then, belonging and citizenship on the one hand and precarity or social and economic mobility on the other, migrants are often used to politically mobilize white workers against them workers who mistakenly blame the migrants for their problems. Our combined analysis of belonging, precarity, and migration shows that instead of the current situation of mutual coexistence and interdependence, but in the context of mutual fear, it is possible to posit a potential politics of commonality between citizens and non-citizens that derives from a deeper look at the connections between physical, social and economic mobility in the context of citizenship struggles. So uh, I hope I stay within my five minutes. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce Felicity Amaya Schaefer, who will go into more detail about the first uh, section of our book. Professor Schaefer is professor of the Feminist Studies Department and the Critical Race and Ethnic Studies Departments at UCSE. She is the author of the book, Love and Empire, Cyber Marriage and Citizenship Across the Americas from 2013. The forthcoming book, Unsettled Borders, The Militarized Surveillance on Sacred Indigenous Land, uh, forthcoming this year. And of course, is one of the co-editors of Precarity and Belonging, Labor, Migration and Non-Citizenship. Thank you, Juan. Um, 
Okay, so I'm going to take my five minutes and introduce the first section. So we really tried in this section to disorient um, some of the assumptions driving keywords in the book, such as mobility and migration, citizenship and non-citizenship. And while these terms usually fail to intersect, we wanted to challenge the segregation of these categories that are socially, politically, and structurally in flux, just as Juan was saying. So for example, while the term mobility is usually associated with social or class status within a nation, migration is oftentimes thought about as movement across borders with declining, you know, those that have declining status and are oftentimes evacuated of rights. And while many migration scholars and activists advocate for citizenship status, we want to sort of question, what about those who have rights without citizenship or those who have citizenship but are stripped of rights? Um, and even thinking about those who refuse citizenship at all costs, such as indigenous peoples. So this section questions whether citizenship status is a universal good, whether it's a stable category, and whether it's an even useful category, given so many with citizenship status have extremely differential access to belonging and rights. So let me give you an example from the first chapter. So Bridget Anderson questions here, taken for granted binary categories such as the citizen migrant. She instead examines the precarity of citizenship, an unstable category that can even be revoked for some migrants based on race, such as black British migrants from the Windrush generation. So in addition, she questions whether non-citizenship should be attached to migrants at all, whether this term is useful historically, given black female slaves and white women in the 1800s were both considered non-citizens. But of course, in incredibly unequal ways, rendering this binary of citizen and non-citizen almost meaningless. So even the term migrant has become such a derogatory term that many are even asking whether we should use this term at all. And for whom does it designate? When, for example, expats cross borders, but of course don't consider themselves migrants, given they actually move to gain more social mobility and rights. So the book attends to these broad forces of globalization, colonialism, war, border security that exacerbate the precarity of more people's daily lives, even those who are trying to stay in place. In fact, the lines between citizen, migrant, and non-citizen fail to hold meaning when we consider the ways border security affects not simply migrants crossing the border, but those such as the Tahona Otham, whose land is crossed by migrants and border patrol on the US-Mexico border. Um, so how might we look at the struggles of migrants alongside indigenous peoples who are being interpolated as migrants, even though supposedly border control is, um, uh, is trying to apprehend migrants? What are the effects on others? So these chapters in the section ask us to um, ask us questions that dislodge the usual ways of thinking about the geopolitical boundaries of citizenship, such as you know when and for how long do some migrants enact political rights and responsibilities in their homelands rather than the United States? Like where is citizenship being enacted? In um, Sering Dampa's essay. She explores what it means for the Tibetan refugee citizen to face the contradictions of Tibetan statelessness and membership in the deterritorialized state of the central Tibetan administration, especially as this diaspora community lives with the hope of a deterritorialized nation to come. So to conclude, um, you know, it's in these interstitial spaces between binary categories that the essays here intervene. Categories that exclude a spectrum of nuances that fail to be rendered knowable, that are rendered invisible by conventional disciplinary frameworks and scholarship. And so to talk to you about the next section, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Steve McKay, 
who's just getting on, and he's a, an associate professor of sociology and the director of the Center for Labor Studies at UC Santa Cruz. His research interests include work, gender, migration, race, and globalization. He's the author of Satanic Mills or Silicon Islands, The Politics of High-Tech Production in the Philippines, and co-editor of The New Roots for Diaspora Studies. His current research on Filipino merchant seafarers examines racialization and masculinity in global markets. He's also conducted local collaborative research projects on topics such as low-wage work, the affordable housing crisis, especially relevant in Santa Cruz, and mixed legal status um, immigrant families. Welcome, Steve. Thanks, Felicity. Thanks, everyone. Um, so yeah, it's my pleasure to um, talk a little bit about section two of our book, which was um, focused on labor and precarity. And um, so I want to start, we use the term precarity a lot, and you've heard um, elements of a definition. But uh, for us, uh, and uh, we define precarity, it's important as unpredictability and insecurity. But what separates precarity from just unpredictability is vulnerability, right? And so vulnerability and risk added to insecurity and, in, and unpredictability is sort of how we define uh, precarity. And that sense of precarity and vulnerability could be, and it started in the realm of work, but it's also in areas of housing, in areas of health, uh, and in other aspects of life, right? So the term really came to be used um, intellectually kind of scholars of work, and especially looking at kind of the changes in the economy under neoliberal capitalism um, and things, you know, so Pierre Bourdieu talked about the precarité, and as the retreat of the welfare state um, under deregulation, financialization, deunionization. Um, and this leading these, these changes in the, in the national economy, leading to a sense of insecurity as well as social e exclusion, right? And so there, um, when we talk about precarity, while it started in some ways in the workforce, it really extended into people's lives and livelihoods. Um, as, as a sense or a feeling of loss of control over one's life. And so that loss or that loss of control coupled with vulnerability very much speaks to the way that migrants get incorporated uh, into our economy, right? Uh, because migrants are, are particularly legally uh, vulnerable. So one of our uh, participants in our Mellon um, uh, uh, seminar, uh, Guy Standing, termed the coin the precariat. Right, And the precariat in this uh, idea is a transnational class that includes workers that have been expelled from the traditional working class, uh, but also includes labor migrants, ethnic minorities, uh, and youth. And sort of what kind of brings together the precariat is this, this sort of lo loss of uh, labor security uh, from formal labor contracts uh, and loss of access to basic services and state benefits or protections. And now this is a, a term, again, precarity that started being used in the social sciences, but really has been taken up across humanities and arts as well, uh, using precarity as a way to connect the subjective experience or sense of vulnerability with the political, social, and economic forces and institutions. So Judith Butler, um, uh, speaks of precarity as a, a form of regulation and as a quote, politically induced condition in which certain populations suffer, end quote. And so um, in some ways precarity in this way can be seen as a, a process as much as a transnational class. And so we often speak of precaritization, um, which is a, a political project often. So the, um, the essays in the section of our book that deal with labor and precarity speak to this idea of looking at precarity as a process that often the state is very much involved in. So Marcel Perret, for example, uses a framework of, of, of studying the South African labor and racial regimes under apartheid to understand temporary ma migrant labor regimes um, in contemporary ones in the United States, China, South Africa, and Palestine, Israel. And so uh, we see, and I'm not gonna 
um, discuss his findings, but we really see how the state plays an important role in creating labor regimes uh, around the vulnerability of certain uh, segments uh, that are really slotted into different parts of uh, labor markets, particularly at the low end. Um, Shannon Gleason, another contributor, uh, focuses more on the United States and uh, focuses on what she calls, um, when looking at um, Northern California, one of the most immigrant and worker-friendly policy contexts in the United States. And her uh, chapter really traces uh, wage theft uh, and uh, attempts by undocumented workers in California to get, uh, retro, you know, to get the wages back. And she shows that even in the most friendly context and a, a bureaucracy that's supposedly status blind, uh, because workers are undocumented, they still are part of a broader regime of um, labor and migration that keeps them vulnerable and precarious despite this protections uh, by the law. Um, and then uh, uh, we also see the same issue of kind of precarious migrant workers um, in Singapore. So Rachel Perennis and her co-author discuss domestic workers who are uh, literally indentured, meaning domestic workers uh, are have a contract where they must continuously work uh, with only one job, aren't able to move jobs and work for a single employer. And their creative uh, uh, chapter traces the use or the denial of cell phones as one way to track the labor regime controlled by um, those who hire domestic workers. And the cell phone being both a, a means of communication uh, and, and to reach out, but also a connection back home to family. And so they trace the sort of the contours of indenture through domestic work. Uh, and Biao Zhang, who's also joining us um, today, uh, speaks uh, in China looking at uh, migrant workers, uh, both internally and international migrants. And for him, seeing the rise of a precariat in uh, China, he asks the question, why doesn't the precariat, uh, like the maybe the old working class, be more organized? And so he traces what he calls pocketed pro proletarianization. Uh, and this uh, idea that migrant workers uh, in China who migrate either internally or externally um, work for wages and get most of their wages from low wage work, but they also sort of foster a sense of entrepreneurship and petty uh, proprietorship that, um, so they often don't see themselves why they're very much precarious um, and, and are precarious in large part because of the labor regime. They don't see themselves as part of a class of workers, but more as entrepreneurs. And finally, Claudia Lopez in her, um, in her chapter talks about uh, Colombia and forced, uh, forced migrants, um, Colombia being the country with the largest number of forced uh, internal migrants. She traces the double displacement faced by uh, rural uh, folks in Colombia, who get displaced because of the war uh, and then um, end up in urban areas. To, to only be displaced and marginalized once again in different ways. So here, the focus on internal migrants same, uh, face some of the same issues uh, in terms of being segmented and marginalized both as labor, but also as migrants. Okay. So that was a very brief passage through the section two on uh, labor and precarity. And so I'm gonna ask, um, uh, Kat Ramirez is gonna come and tell us a little bit more about uh, section three, Kat. Thank you, Steve. Um, the keywords framing part three of our book are citizenship and non-citizenship. Citizenship in its simplest and most general sense refers to membership in a community. However, a citizen is more than a legal or political category. A citizen is also a particular kind of social actor. For example, when we talk about being a good citizen, often we are referring to collegiality, to acting for the benefit of a group rather than for selfish reasons. Indeed, one doesn't need to be a formal citizen in order to be a good citizen. And as citizens' dependence on undocumented workers drives home, one doesn't have to be a formal citizen to participate in the life of a community. Another key word animating part three is denizenship. 
A denizen in the word's most general sense is an inhabitant. In political theory and migration studies, denizens dwell in the territory of the nation state without formal citizenship status. Often they're barred from becoming citizens or their citizenship has been revoked. For example, free and enslaved blacks in the US were denizens prior to the ratification of the 14th Amendment in 1868. Today, participants in deferred action for childhood arrivals are denizens. And DACA, as this program is also known, is a temporary and revocable status that grants certain undocumented immigrants a temporary reprieve from deportation and temporary permission to work. However, because it doesn't lead to US citizenship or even legal permanent residency, DACA formalizes its participants' marginalization, thereby rendering them denizens. Because denizens lack citizenship, denizenship can be approached as a negative category, as the absence of citizenship affecting people who are still present in a country. At the same time, denizenship is the common denominator uniting citizens and everyone else, regardless of anyone's legal status. In this latter sense, denizenship can be positive, promising, and productive. Put another way, it can be both the negative consequence of exclusion and marginalization and the positive outcome of simple coexistence and interdependence. Similarly, non-citizenship can be approached as both a negative and positive category. After all, as Hannah Arendt and Earl Warren pointed out long ago, citizenship is the right to have rights. Without it, people don't enjoy the state's protection and resources and remain vulnerable to its violence and exclusion. At the same time, the category of non-citizenship invokes a world without citizenship, a world that isn't or doesn't need to be organized around citizenship and by extension, nations and borders. Envisioning a world without borders, nations and citizenship is a radical, potentially liberatory undertaking. Part three of precarity and belonging explores citizenship, non-citizenship and denizenship by looking at the spectrum and interplay of dynamic, tenuous, and aspiring citizenships coexisting in any location. The chapters in this section take as their objects of study migrants' serpentine, confounding, and all too often failed quest to adjust their status from undocumented to documented in the US, the US's and Latin America's informal and formal economies, the relationship between denizenship and citizenship, the parallels between African-American denizenship and the denizenship of the documented, and the in-between status of Marshallese migrants who as nationals of a former US territory, imperial citizens in Emily Mitchell Eaton's words, are able to live, work and study here, but are denied a clear path to US permanent residency or citizenship. So part three scope is broad and the chapters of this section are set in Harlem of the Harlem Renaissance, in La Cancha, a giant outdoor market in Cochabamba, Bolivia, in an embattled nonprofit legal services center in LA serving undocumented migrants during the administrations of Barack Obama, whom some dubbed the deporter in chief, and in the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, and Palau, former US territories that have sent their nationals to this country to live, work, and study here without US citizenship since 1986. Together, all of the chapters in part three illustrate the spectrum and interplay of dynamic, tenuous, and aspiring citizenships coexisting in many locations and during different periods. Yet to illustrate that spectrum and interplay, the interdependence of citizens and non-citizens and the denizenship both groups share in common, we needn't look to faraway places or the distant future. We need only look to say undocumented farm workers during a pandemic. 
a group of people whom the state declared essential yet excluded nonetheless. Precarity and belonging grapples with the commonalities and contradictions, the hope and hypocrisy, and the dreams and disparities that bind citizens and non-citizens. So thank you. And I am going to welcome our moderator, Dr. Camilla Hawthorne, um, back to the floor. She's going to provide some remarks before we transition to the Q&A. Thank you, Kat. So the questions raised in this book around the connections between precarity, non-belonging, mobility, um, are close to my heart and to my research on the political mobilizations of Black Italian youth. And in fact, and I've said this many times, I wish this book had come out sooner because I probably would have cited it on every page of my own text. So in Italy, where I work, immigrants and their children and Black subjects in particular are systematically evaluated as legitimate or illegitimate members of the Italian national community based on, among other things, their economic productivity. And I think we can learn a lot from Black Italians, and that's why I'm kind of, I've kind of oriented my comments on them, because in their stories, we see how anti-Black racism, border fortification, coloniality, neoliberal capitalism, how they all intertwine to produce these complex systems of non-citizenship, non-belonging, of denizenship. In the context of the resurgence of racist nationalisms in the 21st century, the category of the white working class has been consistently mobilized to dramatize the threat posed to the national body by immigrants, black people, and people of color generally. In Italy, for example, these fears condense media and political attention onto the figure of the single young black male migrant. Although black women are also targeted in unique ways by this politics of exclusion and scapegoating, because they also represent the condensation of Italy's triple crisis of economic stagnation, immigration, and declining birth rates slash emigration of white Italians. They're portrayed as undeserving foreigners and also as reproductive time bombs who will bring about an ethnic replacement. Italian politicians frequently warn that African women are arriving en masse to give birth on Italian soil, an iteration of the noxious anchor babies rhetoric that is also used to stoke xenophobia in the United States. And yet this is also a very old story as the chapters in this book suggest because a range of technologies of governance have worked in concert to produce the category of the undeserving poor as beyond the boundaries of citizenship, a process that is also caught up with ideas of racial and gender difference. So the work that this volume does is, you know, really challenging the taken for granted separation of conceptual categories, or as Felicity said, um, intervening in the interstitial spaces between categories, like mobility versus migration, citizen versus migrant non-citizen, precarity versus belonging. And in doing so, the chapters denaturalize the assumptions that we make about them and open up space for alternative understandings of politics that are not limited by state sanctioned categories. Right through this, you know, sweeping perspective that is, you know, incredibly capacious in its geographical and conceptual scope we begin to question citizenship as it's framed as the highest goal of liberal politics, the sort of end of a linear teleology of inclusion. We begin to understand both mobility and stasis, right? The right to move and the right to stay as sites of struggle. We can see that inclusion can be violent, right? That one can be incorporated through insertion into structures of marginalization much um, in the way that, for example, Devin Carbato writes about racial naturalization, the way in which one's insertion into a set of racial hierarchies produces a perverse form of naturalization beyond the legal categories of citizenship or membership. So the chapters in precarity and belonging show us that 
immigrants' rights and colonial struggles, anti-colonial struggles are not separate from the project of Black liberation, that identity and political economy do not exist on separate planes, that multicultural mixing and state recognition do not automatically beget justice. By opening up and defamiliarizing and disrupting these systems of categorization, they also open the way onto novel forms of political solidarity that stretch beyond the boundaries and limits of citizenship as traditionally understood, right? For example, through denizenship or through shared precarity, right, as um, an axis of solidarity. So now I would like to invite the editors back into the Zoom room um, so that I can we can kick off our discussion with some questions for the co-editors. And for all of you who are in the audience right now, this is also um, a great time for you to start thinking about questions that you might also want to ask of the editors and to type them into the Q&A as well. So the first question I'd like to start with um, is about the political possibilities and citizenship in its many forms and practices. So as you note in the introduction to the volume, citizenship can also be thought of as a set of subaltern acts, as a process of claiming rights, rather than just something that is granted sort of top down by the state. But we also know that state citizenship is a powerful structuring force in the modern world. And in addition, um, the political theorist Sandro Mezzadra warns us that we also have to be careful of attempts to cleanse citizenship of the burden of, his, of its historical past in these efforts to talk about alternative citizenships from below or subaltern citizenships. So my question for you all is how we square these trenchant critiques of the constitutive exclusions of citizenship with as you say in the introduction, the crucial importance of access to citizenship. What are the implications for actual ongoing citizenship mobilizations by marginalized groups? And is it realistic to begin to think about the abolition of citizenship itself? Well, thank you, Dr. Hawthorne, for those uh, wonderful remarks and that um, important opening question. So I think I'm going to take an attempt at that um, thoughtful question around the issues and the tensions that you raise around the category of citizenship. I think from my perspective and from uh, the research that I've done, really the problem or one of the core problems with citizenship is its narrowness, its bureaucracy, its intent to exclude rather than to include. And I'm drawn to the, as to the aspects of the abolition framework as an ideal, because I think the concept of citizenship has been shown to not work. It isn't um, actually effective in capturing our various realities. And so perhaps we need to think about a residency system. Um, some other form of, um, of, uh, of connection to place that isn't based on a citizenship model. And I think that requires us to have us have just sort of understand that certain things are true, such as people have to be mobile for reasons that are in their control or beyond their control. And if we understand this, then our idea of who belongs where and when can shift. And I think it can open up other opportunities if we think about um, a, a system that's based on a, a residency, for instance, versus citizenship, again, which, because that category has meant to enact so much historical harm. And so in order to do that kind of shift, I think we need to understand that our coexistence is collective. Our connection is interconnected and we have to always center our shared um, humanity. And I'd, I'd like to respond as well, if I may. Um, uh, and I'll begin uh, simply by um, uh, just clarifying that um, what I'm saying, these are, these are my viewpoints. Um, my co-editors may not share them. Um, so regarding your question, um, uh, 
what are the implications for actual ongoing citizenship mobilizations by marginalized groups um, throughout the world? There, there are many mobilizations, there are many struggles. So one here, for example, is for citizenship, for, for example, essential workers. Um, immigrants, um, undocumented immigrants um, in particular, who demonstrated that um, they were essential um, during the, the pandemic. Um, agricultural workers, for example. Um, there has been uh, legislation that has been um, proposed to um, adjust the status of um, these essential workers and um, uh, make them citizens or provide them with a pass to, to US citizenship. And um, I, for one, support um, the adjustment of status you know, of the undocumented. I think that people are uh, more easily exploited. Uh, they're more vulnerable when they're not citizens. And um, in that context, I would say, yes, let's, you know, let's, let's talk about uh, turning people into citizens. Then there's another argument. There's another mobilization which revolves around, um, it's, it's the No Borders Project. And I'm very intrigued by this project because it calls attention to borders as relationships of power. Uh, borders um, uh, are mechanisms that generate and reinforce inequality, and they are central to capitalism, especially as related to the movement of money and workers. Um, however, capital crosses borders more quickly and more easily than, than people migrants in other words. And I think that the, I think when we think about um, the possibility of a world without borders and without citizenship and without, I mean, th this, this, is a, this is a politics of abolition and it requires imagination. And I think that this is where the um, contributions of not only uh, legislators or policymakers are, um, necessary uh, or valuable, but also those of, of artists and activists and educators, because I think that if we are going to look beyond extant systems and relationships, uh, we need to think big and we need to think uh, boldly. And so those are, those are my two cents, my, my responses to uh, your excellent question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kat. Um, the second question I have for you all, and then we'll turn to, we've got some great questions in the Q&A. Um, there are many figures who appear throughout the chapters, right? We have the, the hardworking, law-abiding migrant, the super citizen immigrant, the failed citizen, the, the grateful refugee. And they tell us a lot, not, not just about the workings of citizenship and migration, but also about capitalism, right? And the way that many of the the economic categories that we take for granted, like capital, value, labor, are themselves deeply racialized. And so I'm interested in hearing from you all what, what we get from joining, right, these, you know, precarity, non-citizenship, and mobility, and how that helps us understand the workings of racial capitalism. Um. So that's a great question, Camilla, and I think as someone who studies labor um, and labor markets, I think one of the ways that we can understand racial capitalism uh, and why, but why migration uh, and belonging uh, kind of connect to the racialization is that sometimes we think of production is organized and um, different positions uh, in the labor market are just created and then people are slot into it. And I think if we take it up from a viewpoint of the labor market, we actually see that sometimes it's the existence of a vulnerable population that can be exploited affects how work is organized. And so this sense, this construction of vulnerability, what Mar Marcel Perret talks about in terms of migrant labor regimes is deeply connected to the way our economy is structured. So the kinds of jobs that are available. So he makes a very interesting comparison uh, between uh, areas like the United States and China that need a low wage labor, uh, uh, low wage labor force use migrants either internally or, or internationally as that sort of vulnerable population that could basically do work that native born workers simply will not do. 
but he also looks at South Africa and Israel and Palestine, where the organization of the economy is, right, what do you do with surplus labor? And so the incorporation of, uh, the, of migrants is different in that sense. So I think overall, one of the ways that we can look at how is understand racialized capitalism is that there are particular segments of workers that get politically constructed as vulnerable. And here migrants are at the top of that list because they lack rights that other native born workers do have. And in that sense, that's how accumulation works on the back of a vulnerable population. You know, if, if I may, I, I wanted to add something about um, what is it that I think when I'm speaking just for myself, um, like Kat um, clarify, um, we do uh, in the volume in connecting these categories, um, we basically transform categories that in disciplinary settings are oftentimes thought as transcendental. And we bring them back into the terrain of contagion and contact with other fields and categories and make them part of immanent social struggles. That is to say, we open them to their own historicity. And it, to me, it's, it's, um, it's an issue of uh, not necessarily getting rid of citizenship. It's an issue of understanding how is citizenship operating for everybody now. And that uh, operation is differential. It's inclusive and exclusive at the same time. Um, it can be weaponized. Um, it can be um, weaponized as we are seeing now migrants being weaponized in the border between Belarus and Poland. Um, I, um, the connection between uh, racial capitalism and our effort um, is also um, developed in the concept of coloniality that Aníbal Quijano uh, developed for an understanding of um, the Spanish and Portuguese colonization of the Americas. Uh, and basically without trying to go into further uh, details about that, uh, Quijano's thesis is that the connection that uh, um, the early capitalism of the conquistadors establishes between race and labor, that is to say who has uh, a right to be compensated for their labor and who does not have that right and can be forced as slave or uh, uh, mandated to work as indigenous people for free um, during the whole year or periods of that year, that that particular connection between uh, uh, labor and uh, race, a concept that is created at that moment uh, from 1492 on, um, is foundational for the accumulation strategies of early capitalism. Um, and it's uh, the, what requires then an ideological structure that develops as Eurocentrism and justifies the position of Europeans in relation to the other races uh, in connection with uh, culture, uh, society, and uh, labor. Uh, finally, one thing that I just uh, read today on the latest issue of the New Yorker made me think of this particular connection between uh, race, capitalism, status, citizenship, migration, uh, instability, precarity. I don't know if you have read it, but I highly recommend it. It's an analysis of um, Venezuelan undocumented workers, thousands of them, working specifically in the multi-billion industry of climate change produced disasters, cleanup, recovery and reconstruction. And it's just an extraordinary example of how the status of the migrant, the undocumentation of the migrant lends itself for particularly extractive forms of exploitation by advanced forms of neoliberalism um, um, that organize uh, the, the industry. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Juan. So now um, 
we will turn to some of the questions that we've received from um, the audience of folks in this webinar. Um, thank you so much. We've got three really thoughtful questions. Um, and I'd like to start with a question from Rebecca Garcia. Um, and I'll ask Steve to answer this um, based on you know, the, the research, the community engaged research that Steve has done. Um, and Rebecca Garcia asks, can you be specific on how precarity and belonging apply to Santa Cruz County? Yeah, Rebecca, I have a fantastic question. And the past seven or eight years, I've been doing a, a number of projects locally. Um, and, you know, one of the projects is called We Belong, in large part because it's looking at this issue of how does belonging uh, matter locally? And I came to that because the two other projects, which was one on low wage work, what is it like to be a low wage worker in Santa Cruz County? Um, I found, unsurprisingly, that immigrants face are overrepresented in low wage work. Uh, and face a lot of wage theft, for example. And in our second project on affordable housing, again, we found that um, immigrants uh, faced higher uh, rent burden, they fed, there are more uh, overcrowded uh, conditions and were less likely to um, avail of certain services. Um, even if they, uh, if they, uh, they could, uh, they're often fearful of, of getting services to help them. So our third project on belonging was to really explore this idea, why is it that uh, we're seeing uh, one group of our you know, local population, primarily uh, immigrant families, sort of clearly um, at the bottom of the labor market and shut out out of a lot of services. And, and so, it, uh, so this idea of precarity and belonging, and we really should be talking about precarity and not belonging in many ways, right? Um, very much applies to Santa Cruz County because we have a number of different populations where we can see that combination very true, right? So my work with the, for example, the Day Worker Center, it's been very interesting because their population they work with who do some of the most precarious work uh, are, are had been originally many immigrant workers, but increasingly they're also the unhoused. Um, and so the only kind of work they're able to get with it because they don't have a um, they don't have an address is very casual labor, for example, right? So we see the connection between precarious living, only having access to certain parts of the labor market, which are so poor paying, and because our housing is so expensive, it it has this idea that it's very difficult for them to to ever get out of that precarious situation. So that would be an example of precarity and belonging are very much um, sort of alive as a, as a social issue here in Santa Cruz County. Thank you, Steve. Our next question comes from Yiman Wang, who says, congratulations on the important book. Uh, could the panelists comment on the role of technology ranging from passport photographs, biometrics, border control to gig and platform capitalism in producing and reinforcing the system of inclusion and exclusion, vulnerability and entitlement, and how technologies might also be mobilized to facilitate the common good? Um, and I think Felicity was going to jump in and speak on this question. Thank you. Yeah, that's such a great question, especially as we see um, the borders become ever more virtualized and automated and citizenship status, you know, rely on these biometrics more and more. So, you know, there's lots of scholars that have talked about how important it is to look at and study the science and who's seeing, whose view of the world sees through these technologies that are, of course, deeply embedded in racist ideas, um, you know, gendered notions of behavior. Um, and so more and more, you know, even we have um, an automated border avatar that's being sent to borders all around the world that scans the body with um, 50 different sensors to determine if you're a good or a bad subject, if you have good or bad intentions. And that technology is based on these um, old colonial ideas of racism in which the body supposedly speaks to whether one is a good subject, one, whether one is threatening or, um, you know, a subject deserving of citizenship. So you're right, I think there's so much there to look at. Um, in my own research, 
I've um, gone back to think about, you know, how is it that the border has become militarized, especially um, and relies so heavily on surveillance. And, you know, if we look at the very origins of the border, it really came out of um, the surveillance of in, uh, native peoples who refused to be contained to reservations, right? So that aspect of mobility and freedom that was so important to um, indigenous peoples in the, you know, throughout time, but especially as this territory was becoming US territory, right? The ways in which the border is a settler colonial project and that these technologies are stripping um, you know, these technologies are supposedly more objective, right? That um, they're stripped from human intervention and bias is actually more and more false as we're seeing with all these, this new rich work on algorithms and technology, facial recognition, right? Yeah, it's an excellent, excellent question. Thank you. Thank you. And this last question that we have in the Q and A um, is is pretty open. So I'd say you know any of the any of the editors who would like to jump in. Uh, this is from Megan McNamara, um, and Megan asks, given that you came to this project as experts in your respective fields, what were the findings that especially surprised you? And in particular, she's curious about what was surprising in the linkages with precarity between and across the different geographical spaces addressed in the book. So, you know, we've, we still have about, um, about 15 minutes, I think, left in our discussion. So anyone um, who would like to jump in and answer, what did you find surprising? Yeah, Kat. So thank you for your question, Megan. I can't see you, but it's great to see all of you out there. Um, and uh, thank you for um, referring to us as experts in our respective fields. And I'm just going to admit that I had never heard the word precarity before I began this collaboration. And I wanna thank my colleagues for introducing me to this really important, valuable term. Um, it's sort of like, for me, like heteronormativity, you know what I mean? Just like, of course it's out there. We just need to name it. Um, and, and in order to recognize it and better understand it. And so um, I think that um, uh, this term precarity uh, was circulating more in the social sciences um, than the humanities. Um, and I am a humanities scholar by training and um, it was because of the, um, it really is the interdisciplinary space of uh, the Chicano Latino Research Center, now the Research Center for the Americas, that enabled our collaboration. And, and this is why I think that um, conversations across disciplines and fields are so important because not only can we learn from each other, but often we're, we are having these parallel conversations. We're talking about the same things. We're asking many of the same questions, but we're coming at them from different angles. And, and we think we're the only people thinking about these things. And in fact, we're not. And um, I think that our, our work and our understanding of the world is enriched by um, this kind of openness and, and, and this dialogue. So I'll just you know, give a shout out to my co-editors for um, exposing me to something new and very important. And it is a term that I cannot imagine like living without now. So I'll just add um, a few comments, uh, uh, building off what Kat said in terms of shout outs. I'd like to give the shout out to uh, Serene, Claudia and Emily, because I think um, what they offer us in their uh, contributions to the volume is to really think about precarity across place and time. And if you uh, take a look at their wonderful additions to our book, um, you know, whether it's the ring's engagement with this notion of Tibetan refugee citizenship or Claudia's notion of a displaced form of citizenship or Emily's notion of an imperial citizenship. What I love about reading those three pieces together is it really pushes us to understand um, 
precarity across time and place and geography. And so I really want to uh, give them a wonderful shout out for helping enrich this volume um, and giving us a much food for thought in terms of how the next stages of this work and thinking. Um, yeah, I think, you know, um, just to echo what Kat said and uh, Silvana, it's just seeing the multiple, like thinking about what surprised me. I mean, sometimes it's kind of surprisingly depressing how precarious uh, migrants are around the world. But it also made me think under what conditions and how do you construct some kind of strategy? And one, as a labor scholar, it was always about how do you organize workers? And I think one thing is to think about sort of the subjectivity that we had from all the different contributors to think about on what basis and what kinds of organizing can happen in different realms. But one of the things that was surprising or, or you know, a lesson I took away was that it really does have to be um, on multiple fronts that we understand it um, of how do we address issues of precarity, both as workers and as sort of members, right? So if we think of belonging as really membership, that goes well beyond this idea of citizenship. Then we have to think, well, what does that membership need to look like to make our lives and others' lives less precarious? And in that sense, it goes well beyond sort of the workplace in all the other kind of realms, but it also means then because it's politically constructed that we could kind of politically construct an alternative. Um, and I think this is where having different disciplines and ways of thinking about what are the terrains in which we create what might be called a more inclusive politics of belonging, where everyone can belong and become a full member? That's really the object. And then using all these different examples, just how varied that terrain is, but also where all the possible interventions could be. You know, uh, the question was what surprised us in, um, personally in this process. Um, before the volume, I have had been working for a long time on uh, elaborating a concept, uh, internalized border zones that I use precisely to analyze in different realms, restaurants, the soccer field, uh, the corner store, um, sort of, uh, um, literary and cultural rendering of uh, the points of contact between those who have rights and those who don't have rights, but uh, considering that all of them live in the same space and are connected by, connect by relations of interdependence, and then surprisingly mutual fear. Um, and what was surprising to me as, as my colleagues expanded um, my own vision of that was how productive as a heuristic idea that condition was globally. And it shouldn't be so surprising if you think of neoliberalism and racial capitalism um, as, as a common condition uh, at the planetary uh, scale, but it's still um, really um, rewarding and thought provoking to see the many different geohistorical cases that could contribute to this radical historicization of these oftentimes uh, transcendentalized uh, concepts. The final thing that I would add to that is it was really interesting to see different disciplinary methodologies and approaches converging on the idea that the subjective and the objective fuse under neoliberal capitalism, that the production of subjectivities of a particular kind subjected to conditions of insecurity, instability, precarity, um, it's, it's one of the forms of accumulation, that is to say that the production of that subjectivity is itself the objective condition of subjects under capitalism. Um, and so that, that connection of these different spheres, the subjective and the objective, fuse into a system that exploits 
mutual fear, but creates these conditions of friction uh, between those who have rights and those who uh, don't have rights or see their rights curtailed by racism, racism that written globally uh, was a really, um, how could I say, nice expansion of my own universe. I'll just add very briefly that I think um, along the same lines that you're talking about, Juan, there was a way that once the book sort of came together, um, I think we're always trying to imagine how we can collaborate and come together and dismantle, you know, whether it's borders, citizenship, but it really became exciting to see very clearly how workers could be could see themselves next to migrants in ways that I hadn't even been able to see before. So I think that was the most surprising and exciting for me was to really um, get this broader sense of this global movement that could be possible, right? When we really um, decide to sort of put these concept, even citizenship, like the dismant, the abolition of citizenship became much more real to me um, after this collection came out and I saw all of these essays next to each other. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And I, you know, I really love this framing of, you know, of what surprised you, um, you know, one of the best pieces of advice that I, you know, that I've ever received as a researcher was, you know, find, find the thing that surprises you or that confuses you, the tangle, the knot that you can't untangle and that, that becomes the story. And I feel like that's so true um, for the work that you have all done with this volume. Um, so thank you all so much for joining this afternoon's University Forum. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists, um, to the event organizers, to all of the participants, and especially the folks who asked such thought-provoking questions. Um, and thank you again to our co-sponsors, the Institute for Social Transformation, the Research Center for the Americas, the Humanities Institute, the Oaks Provost, and the Baskin Endowed Chair in Feminist Studies. Please join us again on December 7th for the next University Forum, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Camilla. Thank you.